Hello and welcome back to this video series on personality. This particular video is going to be focused on the personality trait openness, which is all about creativity, thinking outside the box, and also it correlates to some extent with IQ. So as usual, we're going to be looking at the high level trait of openness, what exactly it means, what are the common signs of someone with high openness and low openness, but then also break it down into its two sub traits and look at exactly what those embody. In many ways, the trait of openness makes a lot more sense when you break it down in this way, because it's a bit too high level and abstract and murky when you look at it as one single trait. Once you slice it in two and actually divide it into its two sub traits, you'll see that things start to make a lot more sense and then you can view openness as the combination of these two things. So overall, people with high openness are motivated by ideas and aesthetic experience. And this is something that they pursue for their own sake and you'll see that reflected in their personality. But now we're going to go a little bit deeper and look at some of the common differences between someone with high openness and someone with low openness. And as I mentioned before, there really is no such thing as one being better than the other because it really depends on your environment, your career and so on. Because some careers, certain environments are better suited to people with high openness and equally some are better with low openness. So here we are and on the left you'll see traits that typically align with someone with low openness and then the corresponding trait with someone with high openness. So the first one is conventional versus original, down to earth versus imaginative, uncreative versus creative, simple versus complex, incurious versus curious, having narrow interests versus having broad interests, cautious versus daring, dependent versus independent, conservative versus liberal, and traditional versus progressive. These last two make a lot more sense when you understand at a high level what openness is and why someone might be more progressive or more liberal if they're more creative and have higher openness versus the kind of conservative and practical aspect of having lower openness. As I said, you can actually break down openness into two subtraits. And the first one is aesthetics, which is more correlated with creativity and kind of visual and sensory experience. And then there's intellect, which is more correlated to abstract thinking and trying to understand and digest complex ideas. So overall, someone with high aesthetics tends to enjoy the beauty of nature. They believe in the importance of art. They're reflective. They become deeply immersed in music. They enjoy poetry, are highly emotional, need a creative outlet, see the beauty in things that others may not notice, and they're more associated with creativity as previously mentioned. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have all of these in abundance, but these are the main traits that are correlated with having high aesthetics. When it comes to intellect, these people tend to be quick to understand abstract ideas, they can handle a lot of information, they like to solve complex problems, they enjoy philosophical discussions, they often read, they think quickly, and intellect tends to be correlated with IQ, although they aren't the same thing, and we're gonna actually look into what exactly intelligence, IQ, and intellect is in a little while. So starting with IQ, what it is is our best estimate for someone's general intelligence. And even though there are some subtleties and nuances around this, because someone can practice IQ tests, for example, and get quite good at them to the point where it might be slightly misleading towards their actual IQ but at the same time it still is a good measure and one that's highly correlated and predictive of one's life outcomes. So if IQ predicts general intelligence what exactly is general intelligence? Well in simple terms intelligence is your ability to think quickly process information and learn more rapidly. So someone with higher IQ tends to be able to absorb more information, retain it, remember it and understand it, and also process and calculate things faster than someone with lower IQ. But this isn't the same thing as having high intellect, as intellect is more about your appreciation and your proclivity towards abstract ideas. So someone with high intellect tends to enjoy absorbing information, trying to understand the way things works, and even though they might actually have lower IQ, it still doesn't take away from the fact that they're interested in these particular areas. In short, IQ is a measure of your cognitive ability, whereas intellect is more of a personality trait, and therefore it's more towards what kind of things you're interested in and how you approach various different situations. Now we've sort of glossed over what exactly is intelligence, but actually you can break that down into two separate categories. The first being fluid intelligence, 
and the second being crystallized intelligence. I think it's best to think of fluid intelligence as more of like your natural aptitude because it doesn't rely on prior knowledge. It's technically how fast you are able to calculate and process information and how easily it is for you to absorb and retain information. Whereas crystallized intelligence has got knowledge built into the equation too because it's how you're able to apply prior knowledge to a given situation. So this obviously heavily depends on the kind of knowledge you have and the quantity of knowledge that you have. One of the other big differences is fluid intelligence tends to decline with age. So once you reach about 25 or so, fluid intelligence starts to slowly decline with age, even though this decline may be quite slow and it's even more so if you take care of yourself, if you exercise, if you eat healthily, and if you don't, then it can decline a little bit more rapidly. But crystallized intelligence can actually continue to grow because you're accumulating more knowledge and information all the way up to about 65 and then maybe that starts to taper off and decline after that as well. The other thing about crystallized intelligence is it's obviously related to knowledge and therefore it places a lot of importance on education because someone who has a naturally high level of fluid intelligence doesn't actually reach their full potential unless they're able to maximize their crystallized intelligence as well. And this comes down to education. How and what kind of information you tend to absorb is based heavily on your environment and your fortune in life when it comes to what kind of educational resources you have available. The thing about intelligence, particularly fluid intelligence, is it's one of the most unfair aspects of being human because we're all dealt different cards and some people have a naturally low base point and other people have a naturally high base point. And this obviously can then be modified to some extent based on your environment, your education, but really this comes down to your crystallized intelligence. What this means in practice is that even though you might have an average or below average IQ, you can kind of compensate or make up for this in some ways by having a good or high level of crystallized intelligence, which like I said, comes down to your education and your willingness to absorb information and expose yourself to healthy and good ideas. As I previously alluded to, the way to assess your overall general intelligence is through an IQ test. And there are many of these floating around online that you can try, although I would recommend looking for one that has a little bit more recommendation or approval because there are many of them that are overly simplistic and they're there to kind of make you feel better about yourself by inflating your overall score. I want to move on a little bit from IQ and intelligence and more towards creativity. And even though there is some link between creativity and intelligence, I also think it's quite a separate skill and therefore understanding exactly what creativity can be quite useful. A common misconception actually is that people think creativity is quite common and exists within everyone to some extent. And actually, even though there's a slither of truth to this, but at the same time, creativity is a surprisingly rare skill and it's something that follows what is called a Pareto distribution. And this just means that most of the creativity comes from a very small percentage of people. And you can see this reflected in everything from art and music, where most of the most famous artists and musicians from history actually have produced most of the work that is still seen today. In short, creativity is the ability to generate novel and practical ideas. And these ideas can come in many different forms, from painting to poetry and literature, all the way to ideas in business and solutions to various problems. Creativity, like wealth, follows a Pareto distribution. And in the case of wealth, this just means that a huge amount of wealth accrues in a very small number of people. And in the case of creativity, a huge amount of work comes from a very small percentage of people. And did you know that 50% of all of the works from classical music come from just five composers? And out of those five composers, 95% of what is played today comes from just 5% of their total work. So this just gives you an idea of how rare creativity is and how it tends to converge and accumulate in very small places and towards a very small number of people. To measure creativity in the same way that we do with an IQ test when it comes to intelligence, we instead use something called the divergent thinking test. And an example of this would be to say I gave you the challenge or the task of thinking of as many different uses for a random object like a brick, or think of as many different words you can with something starting with H. These are two random examples where Initially, they seem quite simple, but you'll see that there's a huge variation in the kinds of answers that people produce. Some people can only put down two, three, four or five, 
different answers, whereas others will put down 100, 200, or even more. This just shows that someone's ability to think outside the box, think of something random, and also make connections between different things all comes down to the trait of creativity, which is related to openness and aesthetics. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video and the series overall. The next video is probably going to be the last one, which sort of combines everything that we've covered so far, but also introduces some interesting stats and facts and combinations of different personality traits and what that translates to in the real world. So if you're interested, definitely keep an eye out for that. Also, feel free to leave any comments, questions or suggestions in the comment section down below. As I've previously mentioned in other videos, I have left in the description different personality tests that you can take, which can give you an overall idea of where you score in each of the personality traits. So check that out if you're interested. And overall, I'd really appreciate if you can subscribe and like if you enjoy this content. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.